right, guys, welcome. Um, my name is Andy O'Keefe. I'm a clinical fellow in allergy and immunology uh, at McGill right now at the Montreal Children's Hospital. So I did my pediatrics training in medical school here. So I think I met some of you guys when you were med students. Um, and I'm finishing my fellowship in just five days. So today, um, uh, Dr. Turvey and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, allergy and immunology as a career, and also we are going to uh, present some interesting cases. Um, so that's me in a lovely file photo. Um, and the objective today is to, uh, to give you guys some exposure to allergy and immunology because um, as a trainee here, um, I certainly didn't get a whole lot, so I imagine that your experience hasn't been too much different. Um, to expose you guys to some of the different um, facets of allergy and clinical immunology. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Stuart Turvey, who is our uh, visiting speaker, and he's an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. He uh, works at the BC Children's Hospital, so he's a pediatrician as well. Um, prior to coming to Vancouver, he had completed pediatrics residency and a fellowship in immunology at uh, the Children's Hospital through Harvard Medical School. He also uh, has been a Rhodes Scholar and trained at Oxford University where he completed a doctorate in immunology. So we're very excited to uh, welcome Dr. Turvey today. You can clap. <laughs> okay. So I'll jump in here. So, so welcome everyone. We're filming this today too, so that we can use this as sort of outreach across the, um, across the country. But my question actually is anyone thought about allergy or clinical immunology as a career option before today? We, we have some in our program, but they're not here. That's okay. There's about three of them right now. Excellent. So hopefully we'll convince you by the end that this is the way forward. Okay, um, so let's just talk a little bit about, uh, about allergy. This is, is potentially preaching to the choir, but let's just think about it. So it's a huge, actually a huge problem. So 30% of the world's population is affected by some sort of, um, some sort of allergic disease, 20% with asthma and allergy, and, and then food allergy also being a big burden. So clearly it's a big global problem. Big issue in Canada, up to 10% of um, Canadians you know, report self-reporting allergies. It's you know, depending on the estimates, up to thirty percent having some form of allergy. Asthma, the, um, one of the most com common chronic diseases affecting Canadians. Asthma rates have tripled, really, in sort of one or or, or two generations. So these are diseases that have have global burden and also a big Canadian national problem. I want to tell you about allergen because we have their banner and 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 we here representing Allergen. So, so Allergen is a research network funded by the federal government. So we're not, it's not a drug company. Um, it's a, it's a really, a, is a, a national research network funded by the federal government in recognition of the really crisis or epidemic of allergic disease. And so the, the aims of Allergen are long and wordy, but really to discover some of the fundamental causes of, of asthma and allergy and then to develop networking across the country and capacity building in understanding and treating these diseases. So it really spans from, from bench to bedside. And here's Allergen. This is the network. You can see there's some holes in that, that map of um, Canada and we're looking to try and at least plug one of those, those holes of where, that, where this network lives and, and where um, it has its influence. So let's talk a bit about allergy and clinical immunology. So it's a, it's a you know, well-recognized subspecialty, been, been recognized in Canada since 1968, and you know, offers, I think, nice opportunities in research, education, and clinical practice. And there's really a big Canadian shortage, quite a, potentially quite acute here in this province, but really actually across the country, uh, there's, a, there's a shortage of allergists, clinical immunologists, and, and clinician scientists who are sort of doing uh, both research and providing clinical care. So why are allergists and immunologists important? It's, it's pretty obvious, but it's, it's worth saying that you know, patients that are treated by allergists just do better, and, and th these have been measured in, in lots of standard outcome measures. Emergency visits, hospitalizations, sick visits, and then you know, just 
just better productivity and, and better satisfaction with, with their care. So we, although we're preaching to the choir, there's, there's really good data suggesting that um, having allergists caring for patients affected by these diseases is beneficial for their outcomes. You know, one of the problems, you know, so even in well-served centers, I, I'm from Vancouver, uh, wait times are unacceptably long. So for a child with food allergy wanting to see an allergist, up to 12 months wait time in Vancouver. Um, but, but clearly other uh, communities are under or potentially unserviced by specialists in this, this area. And that doesn't, ultimately doesn't help the patients, but also doesn't support the clinical community in terms of um, you know, education and, and being able to support these patients. So why is there a shortage? Uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's lots of reasons, um, but one big piece is really lack of exposure uh, you know, during training to this, uh, to this specialty as an option. And we're you know, looking to s try and bridge that gap somewhat with this program. Here are the numbers. It's, it's sort of interesting, I, I think. There's uh, right now listed 183 allergy clinical immunology specialists in, in Canada. In five more days, there'll be 184. Um, and so the estimate is that it, to service appropriately, you probably need about 300, um, 350 allergists. And you see, the, not surprisingly, the bulk of those are in um, Ontario and Quebec. Uh, Newfoundland, I think there's, we, I think our numbers are wrong, and there maybe is one person here now since January, so we got to update our slide, but it's still a pretty small number. <laughs> and they're all old, um, and so <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's also a problem for the, for the specialty. So what do they do? You know, and you guys probably recognize and, and know this, but, but I, I think you know, one of the nice things about allergy clinical immunology is a, is a whole body holistic service that isn't focused on one individual organ system, but really is allergic disease um, you know, affects all organ systems. And, and you can think of the obvious things, respiratory tract, allergic rhinitis or asthma, the eyes with um, uh, con allergic conjunctivitis, you know, adverse reactions to foods, drugs, other things, obviously a whole body problems. And then, then potentially we're also involved within, with um, immune deficiencies and treating autoimmune diseases, which have, have many potential manifestations. So it's, I think it's a nice, nice specialty because it is really quite holistic, uh, dealing with all body systems. And you know, what do people do? You know, I, I think this is always a, a decent question. Much of allergy immunology is office-based, um, and there can be a mix of both um, uh, either hospital outpatient-based or private practice-based work, but with, um, you know, in-hospital consultation, particularly around the, the clinical immunology piece. Um, and so people are you know, working hard within their, within their clinical, clinical specialty, but also tend to be quite engaged and interested in other aspects. So, to, so lots of teaching happening within the office space, space and um, you know, being involved in, in committees and, and research programs and, and contributing to CME act activity, uh, clinical guidelines and others across the country. You know, so why do we think it's good? I, I, I've made the pitch, we're almost done here. You know, it, nice working hours, to, to be honest. Younger patient population, I'm, I'm a pediatrician, so um, anyone older than five is kind of old for us. But, um, but you know, generally young, with lots of good treatment options, and truly the, the ability to transform people's lives when, when we recognize and can treat or avoid some of these, these big triggers. Um, you know, salaries that, that allergists make are, are really quite competitive. And there's lots of, lots of job opportunities across the country, which clearly isn't true for a number of um, subspecialties where people maybe are training, but have a good chance of actually not working in, within their specialty once they've finished training. And maybe the most important thing, you will be happy. So these are real data, we didn't make this up, published by, in the CMJ, um, CMAJ from, from 2004 survey. They asked the question, What's the degree of satisfa satisfaction with your current professional life? 
immunology it's called, it's really allergy immunology, way out ahead, clearly gapping the, the field. And, um, and it was sad to see the biochemistry people were unhappy. Well, they were 65% happy. So and I think it's actually true. There, there is a, a measure, but the fact that it is a nice job with, with a you know, nice and reasonable lifestyle, uh, I think allows, allows this group to be at a generally pretty happy group. So I'm going to hand over to Andy, who's going to tell you about the training opportunities. So I'm, as, uh, as I said, I'm just at the end of my training right now. So I know um, a lot about the training programs at McGill and a little bit about some of the other ones. Um, so if you have any particular questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. But um, this information is available on the CARMS website where all the different subspecialty programs are listed. But in general, there are eight uh, subspecialty training programs for allergy and immunology across the country. Um, allergy and immunology is a huge field and kind of covers two specialties at once. So what different programs offer and different programs will have different strengths and weaknesses. So if your interest is more in um, autoimmunity and immunology, some more programs may be suited to you than others who focus primarily on allergies and asthma. So there's really lots within the field to, to pick and choose from. I think, um, as we talked about, that this is going to be something that expands uh, with time. Um, lots of what we see now are, are new treatments coming down the line that are very targeted biological uh, therapies with monoclonal antibodies. Um, and antibodies are property of immunologists. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the staff immunologists at, uh, at McGill jokes that there are um, uh, disease processes caused by the immune system and disease processes caused by things that we don't understand. So really immunology is a, is a whole body uh, specialty and we really need to consider all sorts of different facets. So um, it's, it's a great specialty in that you can really tailor your interests to, uh, to whatever you want. Um, and I think there's lots of different training programs that uh, give you a lot of different opportunities and options. So I'm not going to kind of go through all the numbers because those change uh, every year, but uh, there's lots of great training programs out there. And if you're interested to pursue uh, electives, um, then I think that's a, a very worthwhile thing to do. And they're also available on the, on the CARMS website too. They have an up-to-date um, list about, about all the different training programs. So looking at some of the numbers, um, there's been kind of a, a, a variable number of uh, trainees in allergy and clinical immunology uh, over the past couple of years. In general, it's on the rise, which is a great thing. Um, but it's still quite dwarfed by many other specialties like cardiology and respirology. So um, there's a huge need uh, for allergists and clinical immunologists. Uh, and there, this need will continue because even though the numbers of trainees are increasing, um, it's nowhere near most other uh, subspecialties in pediatrics and internal medicine. So there's a few different ways that you can explore a career in allergy and clinical immunology. The Canadian Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology has a program called NREP, which is the National, Regi uh, Re National Regi Resident Education Program. And what that involves is the, uh, you apply to uh, the CSACI. There's information on their website, which is uh, csaci.ca. And then you get to attend the national conference um, and network with, uh, with allergists, with uh, um, people in training, um, and program directors as well. So it gets you um, the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the specialty. And the nice thing is that they uh, cover your travel costs, your conference costs. Um, so they put you up in a hotel for a couple of days. You get to take a free trip. Um, I think in return, you probably have to write a, a, a short paper about um, what you did on your summer vacation. But um, it's, a, it's a program that I took part in. And if you're interested, it's kind of a, a, a no cost way to learn a little bit more about allergy and immunology. The American Academy for uh, Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the Quad AI, has a similar program called the Chrysalis Project, which is pretty much the same uh, sort of affair, except that it's an American meeting, so you get to travel to somewhere outside of Canada. Um, so that's another opportunity that you have to explore uh, allergy and clinical immunology and to attend uh, a national conference. And more information about that is at uh, quadai.org, or AAAI. AI.org. 
Okay, do you want me to talk about this? So let's. So that's our the end of our pitch about why allergy immunology is obviously the only useful choice. Now I, th I thought we could just talk a little bit about uh, medicine, do a little bit of teaching, maybe a little bit of interaction as well. So this is sort of interesting data. And if you think about us, we evolved and our immune system evolved to help defend us against the multitude of pathogens that, that were out there. Um, but clearly over time, we've started to deal with those pathogens through vaccine and high, uh, better sanitation and, and, and other treatments. So, so, you know, what we see since here, since the 1950s, is sort of classic infectious diseases. Those rates have really plummeted. But in parallel with that, in, over that time, same time frame, diseases caused by our immune systems have increased um, in rate dramatically. And so there's this idea, and, and, and there's data to support this, that it's all about balance. We evolved to be very good at fighting infections. That's what our, our body was set up to do. But now that these infections are, are, are less of a problem, we're starting to, to really bear the burden of, of these immune dysregulation type conditions. And, we're, and you know, a big research focus is, is to try and understand you know, what's going on with this. And some of these numbers are pretty striking. It, you know, asthma, for example, you know, huge acceleration really in one, um, one generation. So why is there a big increase? Do you guys have any suggestions, hypotheses? Here's some things up here, but any feeling for why there's been such a dramatic increase in, in atopic or allergic diseases? Any that you like or want to talk about? Hygiene's a good one. Hygiene's a good one? Yeah. Yeah, and so the hygiene hypothesis is sort of the easiest one. We, we often go to that. And there's lots of data around that. So, for example, if you grow up on a farm, um, and the study is mostly done in Germany and Bavaria, growing up on a farm is protective. And it's interesting, actually, that what they, they me measured things like um, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and showed that, which is you know, from the, the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, probably in the poop of the cows and things, if you had high levels of LPS in your pillow, you were more protected than others. So, so it seems to be that you know, exposure to these, these things is helpful. There's other interesting data. Um, if you're born in a big family, so six kids, and you're the fifth or sixth kid, you're protected compared to the, f the first or second kid. And, and that, when you think about that, the reality is that th those later children are exposed to a lot more infections quite early in life. If you go to daycare in the first six months of life, you're protected, which again is the same as growing up in a big family. So there's lots of data around the, the hygiene hypothesis. The mechanism, you know, why does the, you know, why do these early life exposures um, help protect you? That's uh, not really understood, but something that's, that's a very hot topic at the moment is around the gut microbiome. The, so the bacteria, the friendly bacteria, the healthy bacteria that live in our intestines are really important for shaping our immune response. And that may be the mechanism for the, um, for the hygiene hypothesis. And so things like early life antibiotics that will affect our, our um, gut microbiome, increase risk of asthma and allergy being delivered by cesarean section as opposed to vaginal delivery increases the risk of um, asthma and allergy and alters the gut microbiome. So you know, there's, a lot, there's a lot of work in that space. One thing that the Allergen Research Network and, and is very involved with and that, that I personally am really involved with is a huge study called the CHILD study, the Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Study. And this is a cohort study of over 3,000 children we say across the country, but it's not really true. It's Vancouver, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Toronto. So that sounds like across the country when I say it in Vancouver, but when I say it, I say it here, it doesn't, it rings a little hollow. Uh, so, um, so, so four um, large cities in, in, in Canada are affecting you know, some part of the Canadian population. But the nice thing is, you know, we recruited the pregnant moms and we've recruited lots of biological samples and, and other things and are starting to put together some of these fundamental causes of, of asthma and allergy. So we thought we'd, um, 
it'd be helpful just to maybe talk about some cases and, and do a little bit of teaching. So Andy's going to talk about some um, allergy cases. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about immunology and immune deficiency. Um, and so if you, I'll pimp you all a little bit. You might as well. OK. All right. So um, being a pediatrician and speaking to an internal medicine crowd, it was hard to figure out what, uh, what to present to you guys. Um, but if you like in your imaginations, you can add uh, two or 10 years to the ages of these patients because I think they're uh, cases that could be seen in, uh, in pediatric or adult cases. So the first case I'm going to present is a 16-year-old male who had a history of sickle cell disease and thrombocytopenia. He came into the emergency room one morning at 4 o'clock. And he'd woken from sleep around 2.30 that morning with lip and tongue swelling. Uh, this was associated with dysphagia, dyspnea, and dysphonia. Um, does anyone have any thoughts off the top of your head? Be worried about anaphylaxis. That's an important consideration for sure, especially since this is an allergy talk. <laughs> so anaphylaxis is um, an Im important uh, first thing on your differential diagnosis. Um, the patient was in apparent respiratory distress, though he was sat in 100% in room air. He had marked left-sided facial swelling, and when we looked in his oropharynx, this is what we saw. So his tongue was quite swollen. Um, you could hardly see his uvula. Um, it did not look good. So he, um, we were able to get a little bit of history um, before proceeding, and we learned that over the last six months he had a couple of similar episodes, though these had been less severe. They were happening every one or two weeks, and they'd resolve after one to four hours without any treatment. He, um, he came to the emergency room this time because none of the episodes before had been associated with dysphonia, um, trouble breathing, or trouble swallowing. So he noticed a change in his voice, and he had additional symptoms that weren't present before. He'd had a minor dental procedure the day prior, but he he woke up from sleep with this, um, and that was the only other inciting factor. There were no other triggers that we could identify, and waking up from sleep with something without having a, uh, an immediate previous exposure made anaphylaxis less likely for this case. So at um, 7.30, he got some steroids. Um, he wasn't any better, so at 8 o'clock in the morning, he got 0.5 milligrams of epinephrine, um, presumably for a, a treatment for anaphylaxis. But shortly after this, he had critical worsening of his respiratory status, and pr preparations were made for a surgical airway. Um, luckily, allergy saved the day. We were, uh, <laughs> one of our staff was walking, we don't get to do that very often, so when we do, we, we tell a lot of people about it. Um, so we were, we were there in the emergency room um, and advised em empirically to try uh, treating with C1 esterase inhibitor concentrate, uh, which is also known as Baronert. 20 minutes later, that's how his throat looked. So he had complete resolution of his symptoms with this treatment. So what does that mean? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about angioedema, which just is a, another way to say uh, subcutaneous or submucosal swelling, which is different from edema in that it has a, a faster onset. It's often asymmetric. It, and it doesn't happen in gravity-dependent areas like edema would. So angioedema um, happens more often in the face, larynx, and bowels. There are two mechanisms to produce um, angioedema that can uh, go through a mast cell pathway or a bradykinin pathway. So the mast cell mediated angioedema would be things uh, we think of like an allergic type of angioedema, like you would have an anaphylaxis. So these pa patients would tend to have fast onset and resolution. And they would often have other associated symptoms like urticaria, flushing, pruritus, bronchospasm, throat tightness, or even hypotension. He didn't have any of those other things. Bradykinin-mediated angioedema is not associated with urticaria. Uh, and generally develops and resolves over a longer period of time, and there's no identifiable trigger associated with it. So because our patient responded to C1 esterase inhibitor, we figured, aha, he must have hereditary angioedema. But kind of going against that, there was no family history of similar cases. Um, and we know that this is autosomal dominant, um, has an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, although 25% of cases are de novo. Um, you're actually not allowed to give a talk on allergy or immunology without including a pathway, so this meets our quota. Mm -hmm. um, 
And this demonstrates the, so the red boxes are um, C1 esterase inhibitors. So this just shows in the Brady kinin pathway, which is on your right, um, on my right, on your left. Um, that it's involved in several places. So bradykinin uh, goes on to produce symptoms uh, like vasodilation, uh, smooth muscle contraction, um, and increased capillary perm permeability. So the, really the symptoms of, of angioedema. So if your C1 esterase inhibitor doesn't work, you can get increased, um, increased uh, throughput um, into, into the bradykinin pathway. It's also involved in the complement cascade as well. So kind of an, an easy test that we, not an easy test, but a test that we can do for a patient who's having an episode of uh, angioedema is to look at their C3 and C4 levels. And you would expect these to be lower in patients who have uh, hereditary angioedema. So getting back to the case, how do we evaluate for hereditary angioedema. So we look at the C1 esterase inhibitor, and you can do quantitative assays to make sure that it works. Um, and that would be described as type 1 hereditary angioedema if, you're, if you have, uh, sorry, it should be qualitative assays. So if you have, um, if you don't have any, if your body doesn't produce any C1 esterase inhibitor, then you have type 1 hereditary angioedema. If your body produces it, but it doesn't work properly, you have a functional problem, which is type two hereditary angioedema. And we have uh, both functional assays and uh, uh, quantitative assays uh, to evaluate that. We also looked at his complement, which was normal, and his tryptase, which we would expect to be elevated in an anaphylactic reaction, was also normal. So then we kind of started to scratch our heads and think, well, he responded to the C1 esterase inhibitor. Um, that's kind of unusual. There must be some defect in the pathway, but we're just not able to figure out what it is. So there's another entity called type 3 hereditary angioedema, which is kind of just an umbrella term for the other types of hereditary angioedema. We don't really understand what's going on with them. A lot of them have been associated with a gain of function mutation in factor 12 um, and have also been associated uh, with um, estrogen and progesterone. So um, most of the cases were reported in females. So him being male kind of made this less likely again. Didn't, he didn't quite fit into there. However, we did send uh, genetic testing to look at his factor 12 gene, um, and there were no mutations or sequence variations identified. Um, additionally, we didn't identify any other mutations that affect the kinin uh, calocrine system, and there was no family history. So he doesn't technically qualify for a diagnosis of type 3 hereditary angioedema. So um, what he has at the end of the day is still um, up in the air. But what did we learn about this um, case, which is interesting but somewhat unsatisfying because we can't say this is your diagnosis. So the so. Obviously, the diagnosis of sporadic angioedema is challenging and can evolve over time. But also that C1 esterase uh, inhibitor, um, so the exogenous administration of this, can be life-saving and should be considered in uh, severe cases of angioedema regardless of their etiology. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about something that's um, a little more allergic in nature, which is milk allergy. Um, so this is admittedly more of a, a pediatric topic, but just wait and see. Um, milk allergy is the most common uh, food allergy among young children and affects about 2% of young children. Uh, traditionally, the recommendation for kids with milk allergy had, to been, had to been to strictly avoid milk. Um, but recently, in the past couple of years, what's been shown is that about 75% of milk allergic children can tolerate heated milk. So if milk is baked in like a cookie or a muffin or a cake, um, most kids who are milk allergic can tolerate it. And the same goes for eggs. And that's an interesting thing because um, just by a show of hands, how many people here have biochemistry degrees? Only three, wow. Um, so if you're a bit of a nerd at all, you, you remember that um, most allergies are uh, caused by proteins. So the Allergy itself is when you have uh, your body is making IgE uh, antibodies against a particular protein in an inappropriate way. So uh, this is a very fancy drawing that I did myself um, to show that proteins are folded and the epitopes that these antibodies recognize can be different. So sometimes they can be in a folded area like the pink one below, or sometimes they can be in a uh, in a state in a straight sequence 
um, like the blue antibody. So when you heat up a peptide, what happens? It unfolds and falls apart. So if, you, if your body was producing an IgE molecule to the sequential um, epitope, you would still react. But if your body was producing um, an antibody to yeah. the, uh, the non-sequential, to the folded part, um, those antibodies would be out of luck. And they wouldn't recognize, uh, they wouldn't be able to bind to that effectively. So that's why we think that uh, many children are able to tolerate heated, uh, heated milk or heated egg. So the case I wanted to tell you about is a 17-year-old boy. So again, uh, this is something that you could very well see in your practice, um, who had milk and peanut allergy, as well as other atopic conditions uh, in terms of eosinophilic esophagitis and asthma. And he'd been avoiding milk strictly since infancy. So that's a really tough thing to do, especially if you look at any kind of processed products, because um, milk proteins are used in a lot of different things. So it's not a nice diet to have if you don't need it. When he was three years old, he'd reacted to a bread that had been baked with milk in it. Uh, when he was evaluated in the allergy clinic, um, he had a skin prick test, which was nine millimeters, which is a, a big, um, which is big, and would say that you have a, a high likelihood of reacting to a challenge. Um, but his specific IgE to milk was fairly low. Um, so one other thing is that while we know that most kids who can who are allergic to milk can tolerate it in baked forms, we don't have any data on diagnostic tests to help us predict um, at what level is your skin prick test or your specific IgE um, predictive that you can tolerate baked milk. That's only for, um, they're only really helpful for knowing if you've reacted to, uh, to like regular unbaked milk. So I th one of the other cool things I think about allergy is that it's, um, it's not so complicated as you think. Um, if you're not sure if someone is allergic to something, you bring them into the hospital and you feed it to them and you see what happens. Um, so how's that for a fancy test? So what we did is we brought this boy into the hospital and he tolerated the first challenge dose and his mom had baked him some lovely muffins. He uh, first ate one teaspoon of a muffin and the dose was one cup of milk per eight muffins. So we tolerated that, we waited 20 minutes, and after he ate one and a half teaspoons of muffin, he started to develop urticaria, nausea, and vomiting, and he looked like this, um, which is not very good. So I wanted to then shift uh, to talk about anaphylaxis because I think this is something that you need to know about regardless of which specialty you're in. Um, most physicians undertreat anaphylaxis, so don't treat with epinephrine when they should treat. Most patients do the same. Um, the best working definition that we have now for anaphylaxis is when it involves two or more organ systems. So people think that you only really need to treat anaphylaxis if they have kind of critical airway obstruction, but really if they show uh, two or more organ systems involved, that's the time to treat. So some of the organ systems that can be involved uh, can be respiratory, as we know. Uh, gastrointestinal, so you can get vomiting, diarrhea. Cutaneous, obviously, everyone hives, they think anaphylaxis straight away. Uh, neurologically, um, you can be affected as well, and cardiovascularly in, in terms of hypotension. So there's a caveat to having two or more organ systems involved. The other is that if you have hypotension after exposure to a potential allergen, that should be treated as anaphylaxis as well. <clears throat> the treatment for anaphylaxis is epinephrine. Zero, a 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Um, probably for you guys, you don't need to remember that. You can just remember 0.5 milligrams. This is a safe thing to do even in elderly patients. So a lot of people are worried that um, they're going to give their patients MIs um, if they treat them for anaphylaxis. But really, the, um, I think the, the risk of not treating the anaphylaxis is greater than treating it. So I think there have only been um, maybe four case reports in total of people who've had bad outcomes um, for treatment of anaphylaxis um, ever reported. So for ever, but it kind of gets a bad reputation and people are scared about using the epinephrine. The epinephrine works best if it's used early and sometimes patients require multiple doses. So between five and 20% of patients can need more than one dose of epinephrine. After it's used, they need monitoring for four to six hours. 
So there's two types of auto injectors. Uh, well, there's more than two. Um, there's two main ones that we use. People are most familiar with EpiPen, and that comes in two dosages. Again, um, you guys can probably just remember that it's 0.3 milligrams, so it's a little bit less than the uh, maximum dose that you can use if you're in a hospital. Um, but there's a, a, a smaller dose for pediatric patients, um, which is 0.15 uh, milligrams. There's another uh, epinephrine auto injector called Allergect, which is new-ish. Has anyone seen that before or heard about it? So yeah, it's a little, uh, so the EpiPen, is, I should have brought some with me, is kind of unwieldy. It's, um, it's, it's a little bit big, and I'm not getting paid by uh, Allergic, by the way. Um, so EpiPen is, uh, is big, it's in a pen form. Um, it's got instructions printed on the side, so that's nice. But the Allergic is a bit smaller than a cell phone, um, and so it it's n fits nicely into your pocket, um, and it actually speaks to you. So when you take it out of its carrying case, it gives instructions on how to use it. So it's very easy for, um, for patients or bystanders to administer without any previous training. So a lot of people are very happy about that. I had one um, mother burst into tears when I showed her this uh, device because she was so happy that um, it would be life-saving. What if somebody's 27 kilograms? <laughs> so usually um, we, use, um, we use 25 milligrams as the as the kind of cutoff to switch to the, the adult dose or the higher dose of epinephrine. Um, so technically it's uh, 0.3, but I think practically um, 25 kilos is a, is a fine thing. Um, again, uh, ep epinephrine is a, a safe thing to use, uh, particularly in pediatric patients who don't have bad hearts already. So um, we always tell our patients that if you're in doubt, it's better to use the epinephrine than to not use it. So a little um, acronym that they suggest for primary care physicians who are seeing patients who've had anaphylaxis um, to remember what to do is safe. So the first thing to do is to, to seek help. The second thing, identify the allergen. F is for follow up with a specialist and E is for epinephrine. So it's important that um, we're able to know how to prescribe epinephrine, so to know the proper dosage, as well as to demonstrate the use of um, of the auto injectors. So does anyone, um, so there have been studies to, to look at what percentage of physicians actually know how to use an epinephrine auto injector. Does anyone here know how to use one? One person, two people, three people, four people, okay. Um, so do you guys have an, like a, a ballpark figure in your head about how good physicians are at using epinephrine properly? in like the auto injector that's for the public, not for like drawing it up in a syringe. Bad, Bad. you're right. <laughs> so, um, so in this study they looked at, this was a, a study looking at pediatric families, but they found that about 40% of parents knew how to appropriately use epinephrine. Um, about 30% of pediatrics residents knew how to use epinephrine, and about 20% of pediatricians knew how to use epinephrine properly. So, um, at least the residents are doing better than, better than their staff. So that's everything that I wanted to talk to you about, more or less. Do you guys have any questions, um, or is there anything that you'd like to talk about? I'm not going anywhere, so if there's other stuff, we can, uh, we can talk about it later, but we thought we'd have a little break for now and do some questions and answers so it didn't get too, uh, too dull. In that first case, is that drug available? Like, it was just given in Emerge, but I feel like it would take days to find here. So it's, um, it's available from the blood bank. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a human blood product, mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, from, pooled, uh, from pooled blood. Um, so it's available from blood bank, and it's usually available, um, you know, at every at every blood bank. Yeah, yeah. It should be. This is a blood bank product. It should be yeah, okay. national, su least supported. I, I'd be curious to see the last time that was ever ordered in So I, I think that's, that's that's what we're talking about. It. <laughs> so yeah, so that's why we're here to talk to, to people to, to promote some recognition of um, allergy and allergic diseases because um, because they're, they're out there for sure. And I, I know I was speaking to a drug rep who represents 
um, Bear Nerton. He was telling me that there are a couple of families who've been identified in Newfoundland, so they, they are out there. And it is um, an autosomal dominant disease, so they, they do tend to have um, multiple affected family members. Is that the only indication for it? Are there other? For this drug? Yeah. I believe so. I don't know of any others, yeah. Do most labs have that functional assay? Because I'm pretty sure I tried to report that one morning and it, it was a no go. Didn't, didn't happen. <laughs> so I I can't speak um, I can't speak to that to what labs are available here. Um, I know in Montreal we have that the um, we can do the quantitative assay, but we don't do the functional assay at the Children's Hospital. It has to be sent to Quebec. So it's I would imagine um, it's worth asking. So the lab. It's actually worth asking what the lab, so in BC, you know, different everywhere, our lab actually only does the functional one. And they say, and if you have enough of the function, then it, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? So it's probably worth taking that extra step and talking to the, you know, the lab, who, actually people who run the assay and ask them what they're measuring. Because obviously you were asking that question and we're aware of the, the nuance, but. <laughs> So they, uh, I think that's a, you know, an important message for some of these tests is to do that extra step. Um, just for that first case, I was curious because one of the diagnoses that went to my head was mastocytosis. And I'm just wondering, are there features of that that fit with that? Is there anything that points you away from that diagnosis? So does, that's does the antibody that you mentioned, the Varinar, does that would that work in somebody who's having? kind of going back to mastocytosis and thinking about those pathways. Um, so mast cell mediated, um, so the people who have mastocytosis tend to present with other symptoms. It's usually not isolated angioedema. So kind of the classic symptoms are uh, flushing and diarrhea. Um, so theirs tend to look more like anaphylaxis. Um, so they often get hives as well, as well as the angioedema. So the isolated angioedema fits less with the mastocytosis, but it's an important thing to consider on the differential diagnosis. And the tryptase should have helped you with that. Mm -hmm. So if you have lots of mast cells that are letting out, <laughs> spilling their guts, then it's, you know, tryptase is the thing that should, should go up in that one. So it, it depends. Um, I think most uh, most um, position statements and things recommend four to six hours after the use of epinephrine. But if they've required more than one dose of epinephrine, or if they've had, um, you know, like respiratory collapse or really uh, quite severe symptoms, um, then up to 24 hours um, after. So it really depends on the case and kind of your uh, what's happened clinically. What did you do? Probably like three days. <laughs> 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 that is safe and sorry. I was just on the Did you get them? <laughs> so did you? Yeah. So they got epinephrine. They, got they get other those, medicines. Yeah, they got so yeah H1H2 blockers. Um, there we go. Steroids. Yeah. They got lots of steroids. Yeah. yeah. But it was. If I'm thinking of the same case, one of the questioned agents that we thought might be an allergy was prednisone. Is that she? She reported a, an allergy to prednisone, and then the hematologist uh, uh, was looking after her, suggested just giving it because he didn't really believe it. And there were other things, obviously, she was in for complicated reasons, but yeah. Do you see that? Uh, I don't think so. um, I'm pretty sure she went into heart failure from the volume from the platelets. Well, but, I mean, so was her trip taste positive? Uh, the one I saw? Yeah. I think we're talking about different people. Are we this is okay? one of Ashley's patients. I was on night float. Oh, okay. Never mind. And her trip taste was positive. Yeah. You can be allergic to anything. So, you know, never say never. Yeah. Like, you really can be allergic to anything. But it's rare. Yeah. 
and y if someone had anaphylaxis and maybe, you know, I would still give them some steroids, to be honest. Maybe I'd do methylprednisolone to somehow reassure myself that I was different from prednisone, but clearly that I would be fooling myself. So just speaking about an anaphylaxis as well, um, a lot of people um, want to do everything except epi. So we see these patients who've received um, Benadryl and steroids for anaphylaxis, but no epinephrine. And really the evidence for using Benadryl and steroids are uh, very weak at best. Um, so really don't be afraid of the epinephrine. That's probably the best answer. Not yeah, to use it regularly, repeat it, um, and then send, make the patient have this story of anaphylaxis or flight or food allergy, send them home with an EpiPen, tell them, tell them to use it regularly. <coughs> So it's important for us as uh, clinicians to talk about, you know, what reasons do you use the epinephrine for? Um, because, you know, we're doctors and we're afraid to use the epinephrine. So you can just imagine someone who doesn't have any medical training, how they would feel going home with this, um, you know, syringe full of medication. They're really scared to use it as well. So a lot of people don't know when to use it. So. Um, whenever we see someone in clinic, we review how to use it, when to use it, what to do afterwards. So those are all important things um, to be familiar with. Do you guys have any other questions for now? As I said, I'm not going anywhere, so we can talk more after. But we can probably continue on with the, uh, with the talk for now. It is the demand is high in the States for uh, allergists? Do we, do we see a same, the same phenomenon? I think one of the nice things about allergy is that um, you can, there's pretty much an unlimited pool of patients who want to be seen by an allergist because as we were saying up to like 30% of the population believes that they have some sort of allergy and most physicians um, aren't comfortable enough to say one way or the other, um, yes your symptoms are attributable to allergy or no they're not. So we see all kinds of interesting consults. Um, and I think in the U.S. it's probably a, a pretty similar situation that if you want to work in, in the community, then you, you certainly can. If you want to work in an academic center, then those jobs are a little bit harder to come by, um, but they're certainly out there. And again, there's, you know, it's going to be a, 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 a field where things are growing, and uh, I think there'll be more opportunities in the future. Okay. So I'm going to talk about immune systems. Um, and so before everyone's eyes glaze over, we'll, we'll try and make this somewhat interactive and, and realize that uh, immune system and uh, these immune deficiency disorders are out there, are likely being missed. And, um, you know, and that's really a tragedy for the families. So I, I wanted to sort of focus on infections and focus on the clinical aspects of, of human immune deficiency. So, I wanted you to think and sort of understand human primary immune deficiencies, understand some of the classic presentation of these diseases, and then maybe have a, a, a rational approach to, um, to the diagnosis and, and then the, the treatment of these conditions. So they're not really zebras, 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 um, as, 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 as people might think. They're not that rare. You know, one in 2,000 people are affected by some form of primary immune deficiency. So that means your family doctor, or psychiatrist, an obstetrician, these people are in your practice. And the, the data across the world is that the, the time, there's a huge delay from onset of symptoms to diagnosis. That's eight to 10 years often. So they're out there and, um, and you'll see them if you're thinking about them. You know, it's clinical immunology is predominantly a pediatric subspecialty because we're um, seeing sort of the bubble boy babies, but we do, a, a, there's a, a number of immune deficiencies that actually will present in adulthood um, and, and we work um, and see those patients as well. So it, really the goal is to make you more aware of those. So early diagnosis can be, be life save, saving. They can present at any age from birth to adulthood. I think when to 
initiate a workup is a really common clinical dilemma. You know, what, what's normal and when have they crossed the threshold to being abnormal and you know, what, what simple tests can I do? Uh, that's some things we want to talk about. The important thing is actually most of them can be diagnosed with easy tests that are easily available. So we're not talking about crazy tests that are only in some crazy lab. Uh, the tests that, that will make the diagnosis um, would be available here almost certainly. And there's lots of great things we can do. We can really treat and, and often actually cure these conditions. So here's how I think about our host defense system, kind of like layers of the onion. So what protects us from, from pathogens? The first layer is what we might think of as the anatomical and physiological barriers, our intact skin, vigorous mucociliary clearance in, in the lungs. When that's breached, Within minutes, the innate immune system is, is activated, uh, and that's things like neutrophils or uh, other things like that. And then with some delay, the adaptive immune system is activated, and that's the T cells and B cells, the bits of the immune system we mostly, mostly think about. So if anything goes wrong with any of these layers, people will experience more infections. So example, this, this poor baby, pulled down a boil, boiling water, has, has really bad burns, has a good chance of succumbing to infection despite having an entirely intact immune system. Uh, these are the lungs of someone with, with cystic fibrosis. Uh, they have a normal immune system, but because of the, th the thick mucus, uh, the mucociliary clearance fails and, and they end up with chronic infection that ultimately destroys the structure of the lungs. So here they are, what are the red flags that might make you guys think about someone having an immune deficiency? Who wants to shout them out? What would get you interested? Recurrent sinopulmonary infections. Excellent, recurrent sinopulmonary infections. That, that's, a, that's a very good one. Any other thoughts? Some pretty clinical things I'm thinking about, pretty straightforward things so sorry I missed yeah you know so any so maybe just make it broader recurrent infections so just you know and then recurrent infections that damage the organs you know we can get skin infections but when you're getting say lots of pneumonia and end up with bronchiectasis I think you should be starting to think um, I, I worry about those yeah, yeah, and so that's where clinical immunology is now. There is a, so we would say um, anyone with a really severe infection that falls outside the sort of experience of, of well-trained physicians should be making you think about these conditions. And what about pathogens? Are there any pathogens that make you worry? The opportunistic pathogens. Yeah. Know, yeah. yeah, so wimpy bugs, right? That should make you question the Im immune system. And so, so if we look at it, what did I say? Recurring or chronic nature of infections with common pathogens. So just this recurrent element. End organ damage, bronchiectasis being the classic. Um, poor response to standard antimicrobials. So these patients, we give them antibiotics. They don't seem to get better. They come and get IV antibiotics to clear up infections. That's unusual. And then these wimpy pathogens, so, so poorly virulent or opportunistic infections. So pneumocystis juveki, I'm not very good at saying that one. Um, atypical mycobacteria, those, those type of things, I really should, so the pathogens that you think about and may think about it as, as big triggers to make you think about HIV, um, also should make you question immune, immune response. Now that, uh, you know, HIV's, you know, becoming less common, new, at least in, in, you know, in Canada, new cases are becoming less common. Um, I think, when I think about the immune system, I actually think there's kind of four parts. There's the antibodies, the T cells, which are these combined immune deficiencies. There's the neutrophils and phagocytic cells, and there's, and there's the complement system. And, that, and that's uh, not so important. But to realize that antibody deficiencies probably make up about 50% of, of human primary immune deficiencies. And so 
so knowing about the presentation of, of, um, of antibody deficiencies will get you, you know, about halfway there. So let's think about those. So, so again, I'm going to just talk about them under these four big banners. Antibodies or B cell defects, T cell problems, neutrophil problems, and complement problems. And so let's think about them under the big, the big banners. So, so antibody or B cell problems making up 50%. Um, so interestingly, babies get antibody across the placenta in the third trimester and so are protected for about the first three to six months of life by maternal antibody. You guys will be pondering, well, what about if you're breastfed, for example? Does that help? So that breastfeeding uh, transmits IgA, one of the antibodies, but not IgG, which is the one that really circulates the most. So lots of benefits of breastfeeding, but doesn't give you circulating IgG. Um, and antibody uh, production problems present with sinopulmonary infection. So antibodies are critical for protecting our, um, our airways and our ears and, and sinuses. And they protect us from classically encapsulated organisms. So uh, streptococcus pneumonia, I, and Haemophilus influenzae are, are the big ones. Patients with antibody production problems generally handle viruses quite well and classic Examples of, pri of primary immune deficiencies that affect antibody production are things like X-linked agammaglobulinemia, that's boys that don't have any B cells, or common variable immune deficiency, which is predominantly an adult pr problem where patients don't make antibodies well and present with, the, with this phenotype. So the differential, you know, you got to think about things. So I told you they weren't completely zebras, but there are more common things than than immune deficiencies. So allergic disease will, will cause people to have re recurrent sinusitis. Cystic fibrosis, affecting maybe about one in 3,000 people, is, should definitely be on, on the di differential diagnosis, even in, in adults. Again, primary ciliary dyskinesia should be on your differential for recurrent sinopulmonary infections. And then sort of classic anatomical problems affecting the osteomiatal complex, and then you know, more complicated and harder to, to really define would be these environmental issues. Crowding, environmental tobacco smoke exposure, um, you know, lots of kids in the, in the house and those things. So I told you we'd think about doing easy tests, common tests. So if you had a patient who was pre presenting with recurrent sinopulmonary infections, you were worried, you know, maybe this is a, a little unusual, what tests would you want to do? So you're worried the antibodies aren't there, so why don't you measure the antibodies? Yeah, so do the simple test, right? IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE. They're the things I like to measure. You know, are they there? Ask the simple question, are they there or not? There's one more nuanced question that I think is worth asking as well. So they're there, that's the first question to ask, but that's sort of like saying I have eyes, but can I see? And that's not so clear just by measuring total antibody levels. So any ideas about how you might want to know how well those antibodies are working, their quality? Binding assay. Binding assay. Sort of yeah, some sort of functional assay. So you, you're on the right track. That's, you're getting too complicated. So um, we're really wanting to see, can you make antibody to things you've been exposed to? Okay, that's really a question. So. When we think about it, what have people mostly been exposed to? Viruses. Viruses, but hard to know exactly. You know, maybe you know they have a good story of chicken pox or, or shingles. So you could maybe think about measuring, you know, varicella titers. That's not bad. What's something else you know? Vaccines. Vaccines, yeah, yeah. You know, not just the realm of the pediatrician vaccines. So um, tetanus, right? People have probably been vaccinated against tetanus at some stage in their life. And so measuring um, tetanus, potentially diphtheria titers, are really good ways of seeing that you can make functional antibodies. So what did I say? So here, easy, simple test. I like doing a CBC and making sure you have things like lymphocytes. But So just have a look at that, make sure those cells are there. Then quantification of the serum immunoglobulin, so IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE. 
And then antibody titers in response to vaccines. Um, tetanus and diphtheria are ones that are easy to measure. In your adult population, if they're low, what I'd recommend is giving them the shot. Maybe they haven't had, had, had it for 50 years <laughs> potentially. And then six to eight weeks later, look at the titer again. And if it jumps up nicely, that's really reassuring that they can make good functional antibodies. It also tells you a lot about their immune system. If you think about it, something went in their arm, it was picked up by those cells we might remember, like dendritic cells, the T cells and B cells talk to each other and they made antibodies. So that, you know, what seems to be quite simple, tetanus titer, actually in measures a huge amount of immune function. So that's a really good place to start. So just the number, total number, you know, are they making antibody? And then um, what we call functional antibodies, so vaccine titers. Tetanus and diphtheria are pretty straightforward. Um, and you can then also potentially look at their response to revaccination. And then, you know, if this is not looking great, I'd be calling someone <laughs> to, to wanting to talk about that. You know, we'll do more complicated tests trying to define what the disease might be, looking at the different numbers of lymphocytes, looking at more complicated binding assays or in vitro assays, and maybe even getting into genetic testing. But that's, you know, not so important in terms of just making a diagnosis where recurrent sinopulmonary infections were a red flag for you and you had a good look at antibody production capacity. Okay, so everyone's happy with that? What about IgA deficiency? Who here has diagnosed someone with selective IgA deficiency? Or have all these patients in the hospital might be called IgA deficient? Patients come to you? No, not so common. And it's, it's an epidemic in Vancouver, IgA deficiency and other places. So it's worth knowing about because it's a mal, mal? Um, misdiagnosed condition and it's controversial in our field. So I just want to talk about it. So selective IgA deficiency should be defined as undetectable serum IgA. So we're not talking about someone who has something that's a little bit low, below the normal range um, because people were worried maybe they had celiac disease, did the TTG and the IgA and the IgA came back a little bit low, something like that. We're talking about undetectable. Okay, so to be called IgA deficient, you've got to be undetectable. And even when you use that diagnosis, it's really, really common. One, about one in 500 people have this diagnosis, you know, have undetectable serum IgA. And the vast majority of those people are asymptomatic. So, so just be cautious about IgA deficiency as a diagnosis. Only make the diagnosis when it's, when it's undetectable. And then the clinical relevance is, is really only there um, in light of the history. So undetectable IgA can be associated with um, recurrent sinopulmonary infections, but also some other conditions, including celiac disease and, and other forms of autoimmunity. Um, a question that comes up on exams a lot is the IgA deficient patient who maybe gets a blood product, blood transfusion, or um, or some other blood product and has anaphylaxis. Have you guys heard of that scenario before? That, um, that comes up a lot in exams. It's, it's, it doesn't always come up so much in real life, but is often raised. So if you're truly IgA deficient, meaning that you can't detect it, those people can make antibody against IgA. They're not tolerant against IgA and will make um, antibody, including IgE antibody, against the IgA molecule. And so then when exposed to um, IgA, say through uh, blood transfusion, um, IVIG treatment, other, other options, uh, there's a possibility of anaphylaxis. And so a question often comes up, should an IgA deficient patient be wearing a medic alert bracelet, be, be flagging themselves as IgA deficient? Those questions are only relevant if you have undetectable IgA. So that's, that's the important caveat to that. So we shouldn't be making this diagnosis in people who are a little bit below the normal range. So what if you have somebody who is truly IgA deficient and they do need a blood transfusion? Do you just treat them as if they're going to be anaphylactic? Yeah, so true IgA deficiency, again, un, you know, defined as this. Um, 
you need to work so the blood bank has a variety of strategies to deal with that it's complicated for the blood bank they have um, our donors who are um, IgA deficient as well and so then that takes that away they can wash the, the, the cells to remove the antibodies so why I'm telling you this it doesn't sound like it's a big problem here I'm not seeing lots of nodding heads um, but there's lots of sort of ramifications of making this diagnosis um, that have huge implications for the families and then for the health system particularly for the blood bank and so it's not it's not a diagnosis that should be thrown around lightly. If you really have it um, and they need transfusions and blood products, you know, working the blood bank has a variety of strategies, but they're complicated and expensive for the blood bank to pull off. Okay, so that's IgA deficiency. What percentage of patients with a true IgA deficiency will also have the blood transfusion associated antibodies? It's that's a, so that's unclear. You know, to be honest, that's unclear. Um, and the, this talk is given differently by allergists, immunologists, and hematologists, probably, to be honest. We, as the allergist immunologists, think that it's really very, very rare, even in truly IgA deficient patients. And we, would you know take appropriate precautions but will tend to push forward and not be as anxious in the, the sort of hematologists are much more anxious probably because you know ultimately they're more intimately related with the blood bank and the blood bankers and things um, and would activate the sort of cautious procedure more easily so the answer is it's pretty rare um, but it's hard to collect real data um, but absolutely reported and happens occasionally. Um, also out of curiosity, has anybody looked at people who have a documented anaphylactic reaction to blood products to see what percentage of them are IgA deficient? Yeah, so that's probably the best way to do it. And, and when you do that, again, it becomes r really rare. And then people would like to go and look for these anti-IgA antibodies, right, to try and find them. And assays are challenging. So the answer is this often turns up on exams, this question, you know, IgA deficiency and, and um, you know, anaphylaxis. And I think the correct answers are it's only a problem in uh, undetectable serum IgA. And, the, you know, the correct and cautious answer is you should be cautious and, and flag them as IgA deficient and not be, not be cowboys. I think that's the, the cautious and thoughtful answer. What about IgG subclass deficiency? You guys heard about this? It's not a public health menace that people have worried about. Again, it's a, it's a problem that's, m it's a test that's problematic in our field. And I think I, I'd just like to spend a second looking at it. So in IgG, one of the big isotypes of immunoglobulins, there's these sub subtypes, one, two, three, they have different numbers. And, um, and there was a trend that's still somewhat ongoing. People were really interested in, say someone came in with some sinopulmonary infections and fatigue. They would measure total immunoglobulins, they'd be normal. They'd measure subclasses and find someone was low on one of the subclasses. And then those patients would be prescribed antibody replacement therapy, IVIG. So monthly IVIG costing the system, you know, $100,000 a year. Um, and that probably wasn't in the best interest of the patient because generally the clinical relevance of this is, is really uncertain. Again, most subclass deficient patients are asymptomatic. And all I would say is you shouldn't be giving people antibody replacement therapy um, just on, on a low subclass. It needs to be um, clinical history of infections and then this ability lack of ability to make functional antibodies against vaccines and things is, is the measure. Um, we dislike this test so much that we banned it in our hospital. We took it off the list of tests that were available in the hospital. It made our lives much better. Um, and so measuring subclass is just not helpful um, as an initial screen for immune deficiency. Okay, so that's the B cells. We've got four things to get through. We're one quarter of the way there. The other ones will be a bit quicker. That's the, the B cells. That's where adult patients pre mostly present is, is in this B cell problem. 
sinopulmonary infection. So, and then some simple tests to do. T cell problems are much more severe because without T cells, you can't do much. Um, and the, t the B cells can't do anything by themselves. So T cell problems are much se more severe and really are in, in the realm of the pediatric immunologist. These patients present in the first couple of months of life with diarrhea, mucocutaneous candidiasis, and failure to thrive. And they end up with fatal infections with um, uh, candida albicans, pneumocystis, and then a panel of viruses, varicella, adenovirus, parainfluenza, RSV, CMV, EBV. They're the big, big ones for us. And, and this is classic um, severe combined immune deficiency or skid or bubble boy disease. Um, these stories you may hear about because the reality is that many of these kids who have these problems die in the first six to 12 months of life, um, you know, undiagnosed. They didn't grow well, they seemed to be sick, they got a bad virus and they died. Um, and so in talking to your adult patients, talking to mothers, um, you know, the, you may hear stories of this uh, running in families. We'd really like to hear about this because if we can make a diagnosis very early, we can cure these kids. Uh, yeah, and don't forget this bit that the T cells have to help B cells to make antibody. So, so these are called combined immune deficiencies. When the T cells don't work, you end up with a combined pattern of T cell and B cell dysfunction. Okay, this is, let's, um, Let's do a little bit of audience participation. Say you're worried about a T cell problem. What do you want to do? Again, simple tests available everywhere. Measure the number of T cells. Measure the number of T cells, yeah. Before you do that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But before you do that, just look at the lymphocyte count, actually. So if, if, you, if you can take one thing away from you, don't ignore lymphopenia in babies. So, um, so for us, a lymphocyte count less than a thousand or one, you know, depending on the units you like to use, uh, lymphocyte count less than a thousand in babies is a really, really low, and, and really should uh, we should pay attention to that. And it's tragic for us, and it happened to us again last week. Coming out of a big hospital just south of my hospital in Vancouver, <laughs> um, a baby that had been sitting in their hospital for sev for a month or two treated for viruses and pneumonia and things, who was profoundly lymphopenic and had this, had this condition. So first thing, you know, everyone almost gets a CBC, look at the lymphocyte count and, and pay attention for that. And then you can ask the question, you know, what are the numbers of those, those T cells? So that's easy tests to do. Um, lymphocyte count, looking at the serum immunoglobulins is also helpful there. And then thinking about HIV, because you know, that's, that's and then, more, I put this in more advanced tests, but it's not really that advanced, is looking at these lymphocyte subsets, the T cells, the B cells, and these other cells called natural killer cells. Looking at those numbers is the right thing to do if you're worried about a, a T cell disease. Phagocytic defects, okay? So this is the, the third of the four arms. So phagocytic defects, um, we're really talking about the neutrophils and there's sort of two problems you can have with neutrophils. One, you can have not enough of them because you're born with a genetic problem that affects neutrophil numbers. Or you can have a problem, a genetic problem that means they don't work. And that's a disease called chronic granulomatous disease. So the neutropenia conditions, people who end up with low neutrophil counts will present with bacterial infections of the mucous membranes, gingiva and skin, so peri perianal abscesses, uh, abscesses around the fingers, around in the gums, all those sort of bits that open out to the outside world, you end up with um, abscesses there. That's sort of classic picture of neutropenia. Um, there's a rare but important condition called chronic granulomatous disease, where people um, have normal neutrophil function, uh, numbers rather, but those neutrophils don't work. Neutrophils, if you remember, make bleach, that whole oxidative burst, superoxide thing, they make bleach, and that bleach kills bacteria. The, if you have genetic problems that stop you making the bleach, you um, have chronic granulomas disease. And those people 
present with abscesses and, and of, of liver, uh, brain, elsewhere, uh, elsewhere, and lots of lung infections. And there's actually five pathogens that cause 80% of the infections in chronic granulomatous disease. And, you know, if we say it enough, people hear them eventually. Um, so these are sort of unusual, well, Staph aureus is super common causing infections, but if someone has, you know, uh, deep-seated abscesses, liver, brain, multifocal osteomyelitis with Staph aureus, I think you should think about chronic granulomatous disease, even in adult patients, to be honest. Um, and then these other four pathogens are relatively uncommon um, and should make you think about this condition. So, so Burkholderia sapatia complex, Serratia marisans, Aspergillus fumigatus, and, and Nocardia. Those guys, if you hear them, and they're not, you know, chemotherapy patients, in the, um, th think about this condition. There's lots of adult <laughs> patients out there who actually have chronic granulomatous disease who have never been diagnosed. Um, and get diagnosed. There's lots of stories where it's genetic, where uncle has had these infections and he's 50 or 60. The, um, the nephew baby is born, has an early life severe infection, and then people start thinking about other family members. So it, it, that happens all the time. It often gets misdiagnosed for Crohn's disease as well because they yeah. can get granulomas in the GI tract that look yep. very yep. similar to Crohn's. Yep. Um, so yeah. there's kind of some overlap there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a nice point. So that's chronic granulomas disease. Um, I won't torture you. So what do you, uh, what do you do if you're worried about a phagocytic problem? Do a CPC and count the, look for the neutrophils. And then also get the, um, get the heme path people to do a smear and look at them because there can be structural problems in, in the neutrophils that just are really obvious to people who look at them under the microscope. So, so do that. And then, you know, if you're worried about some of these other tests, there's, there's other functional tests to look at making the bleach and other things that, that are um, a, a little more esoteric. And then finally, let's talk about complement. Because again, there's really, in terms of immune deficiencies, two classic presentations of complement deficiency that are worth knowing about. So this is in addition to hereditary angioedemia th that Andy touched on. Um, which doesn't really set you up for infections, but it's a complement problem. There's two complement problems that set you up for infections. So one, so <laughs> complement, if anything makes people's eyes glaze over, it's complement. Um, and I don't think I really understand it. But the one thing people maybe remember is at the end, it makes that MAC, the membrane attack complex, that punches holes in bugs. I think people remember that. Like that's, does that sound sort of, action oriented. And so peop so if you have defect in making this MAC, making the membrane attack complex, and these, it's called the terminal complement issues, you have huge trouble with Neisseria species. And so you end up with um, nice, Neisseria um, meningitis, arthritis, sepsis, um, you know, so meningococcus uh, should make you worry about terminal complement deficiency. So I bet you end up with people here who have Neisseria meningitidis. Has anyone ever thought about complement in those people who end up in your ICU or wherever? So you should. So here, here we'll have a multiple choice question. If you have one bout of say, uh, you know, Neisseria meningitidis, sepsis, meningitis, single bout, what percentage of those people have a terminal complement problem? 1%, 15%, 50% or 80%? A, B, C or D? Yeah, it's 15. So you should screen it. You should think about it and you should screen for it. But it's 15%, there's not many tests we do where we're hitting 15%, but I bet people don't do it. So what about if you had a second bout? So you'd had it once and then you got it again, or you had a family history, sister had had, meningococcal disease and then a couple of years later brother gets it or, or uncle or someone. If you're in those scenarios it's 50 plus percent have a terminal complement problem. So it's worth, worth screening for. 
Um, so we'll talk about the test to do and we'll, we'll think about that. Um, the other one, there's a C3 deficiency, looks for all the world like an antibody production problem. So it's recurrent sinopulmonary infections with these classic encapsulated organisms, but with an added twist that some of them will also have rheumatic disorders like lupus. So if you're seeing something that looks sort of lupusy plus recurrent sinopulmonary infections, you could think about this complement complement piece. So in terms of the terminal complement deficiencies, yes. <coughs> stats that you put for an extra meningitis, do they apply to gonorrhea as well? Yeah, it's not, it's not so clear. I, I got to be honest. So it's it increases your risk there, but. Um, it's not so clear, you know, you got the exposure routes different and, and other things. So, um, so the recommendation wouldn't be to screen for those guys, um, for, for Neisseria gonorrhea, but for um, meningitis, yes. Um, but the data would suggest that it also increases your risk of those, but the environmental and social factors are just sort of more complicated with, with that condition. So there are probably Deficiencies because I guess yeah. serial meningitis would be in the top two or three causes of meningitis. Yeah, yeah. So this isn't this isn't crazily rare. So let's. So I'm telling you this. We'll do the next thing, which is what test you want to do, so you can um, think about doing it. So, so what test then do you want to do to look at complement function? CBC. Good one, but it won't help you with. But thank you. You get a half a point for that. <laughs> so CBC, look at that. But you got to actually, this one, you got to specifically look at the complement cascade. Okay, so you, you said three things there. I'm only going to let you choose one of the three. Consult allergy immunology. No. <laughs> C3. So why are you choosing the CH50 over C3, C4, say? It's a good answer, so you're right. But the, the logic is sort of helpful and, and good to think about. Because it's kind of a summation of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so does anyone, so CH50, you know, what's happening, right? So what, what happens in the test tube? I'm always into what happens in the test, right? There's, they have these sheep red cells and they activate complement and it punches holes in the cells and they pop. Like that's basically what it's measuring. So it's kind of like if I turn the light on, does the light, if I turn the light switch on, does the light come on? So it interrogates that whole pathway in which there's all those crazy proteins Andy showed you. So measuring C3 or C4 or C7 or C whatever is like shooting in the dark. But if you do the CH50, and often the lab will do the AH52, but that doesn't really matter. Just, just ask for the CH50. It'll tell you the whole cascade. Um, C3, C4, you know, it's got a rheumatology world and, and things, right? Um, but CH50 is the one you want to measure to look at the whole pathway. There's a couple of nuances with, this, with that test. So what did I say there? Yeah, CH50, okay. There's some nuances with this test. Um, so, so we're looking for zero, essentially, on this test. So it's, it's like turning the light switch on and off. It's either really, really there or not there. And this test is, is quite sensitive to just actually handling of the sample. So um, if a sample's drawn on a Friday and sits around or gets shipped or something, you'll get these sort of just below normal levels. And depending on how they sort of 80% function, that's unlikely to be real. Um, so CH50 is one of these repeat till normal tests. So repeat it until it just becomes normal or um, you're convinced that it's zero. So there's a little nuance in interpreting that. These middle... Um, you know, slightly under the normal range, probably not real in terms of a, a terminal complement problem. Um, and then one of the questions is, you know, if, if there's someone in the ICU tonight with um, uh, meningococcal disease, it's not particularly helpful to do it in the context of full-blown sepsis because appropriately that, that cascade is activated. So it's one of those things that it's better to do when they're recovered. Um, so that's how it all falls apart, right? You remember in the hospital and then they leave and, and this, the test doesn't get done. Um, if your CH50 is abnormal, 
then you can get into measuring individual components of the cascade, and that's, that's a little nuanced. Um, if you find people have it, what are you going to do about it? So, you know, it's all good to find these diseases. What might you do? Complement replacement therapy, nothing, medic alert bracelet, genetic counseling. <laughs> So, I mean, the answer is we can't, we can't, it's a genetic problem of the complement cascade. So the answer is we can't fix it, but you can do a lot of things to boost their immunological status. So, you know, lots of vaccines um, a, a, across the board. There's all these new um, meningococcal vaccines coming out. I would vaccinate these sort of patients with all of them, to be honest. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, more controversial would be whether you'd get into um, prophylactic antibiotics. That would be controversial. But sort of recognition of the condition, explaining to the family about the risk, um, you know, taking it seriously, seeking medical advice quickly for, for illness, having antibiotics with you if you're traveling, those sort of things would be good, good treatment for, for a patient who you documented as being deficient in terminal complement. I think this is almost my last slide. You guys can count down, but we're almost there. Um, so this is just the 10 warning signs of immune deficiency made by, uh, that I think aren't bad. So some of it's pediatric focus, some of it's adult focus. 10 or more ear infections within one year. So in pediatrics, we have a high standard. We want eight or 10, um, and that should get your attention. Two or more serious sinus infections within a year, that should get your attention. Lots of months on antibiotics, so we sort of talked about that, resistant to treatment. Two or more real pneumonias in one year. Failure of an infant to go, grow or gain weight appropriately. These deep and recurrent infections. So we're not so interested in sort of little s s uh, cutaneous superficial staph aureus things. That's, that's just the nature of that pathogen. Um, oral candidiasis or thrush beyond um, age of one. Little kids get that. People who seem to need intravenous antibiotics. And then the history of the family history. Don't forget that one. Um, people do sometimes ignore that at, at one's peril. There was a, um, an interesting study because those in probably every immunologist's office, there's a, a poster like that um, on the wall. So there was an interesting British group that had, I think, a cohort of about 500, 600 people with primary immunodeficiencies. And they found that um, the, the two best, most predictive factors were a family history and yeah. need for IV antibiotics. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of thought behind, you know, if, if you're on a bus and 100 people are exposed to something, uh, three people get sick and one person gets so sick that they have to come into hospital for IV mm -hmm. antibiotics, what was different about that person versus everyone else. Um, so these are all, if you see a patient with any of those things, it's a reasonable thing to consult immunology about, but in particular, the, the family history and the need for IV antibiotics are two of the more important ones. Another interesting part they found about that study was that 20% of their cohort actually presented with autoimmune yeah. uh, phenomenon. So cytopenias in particular are um, <coughs> kind of a, a more and more recognized uh, presenting symptom of primary immunodeficiency. So at what point do we stop worrying about immune deficiencies in people who need IV antibiotics? Because I mean, the hospital's full of these people. So and it's like, do I have to worry about the 89-year-old guy with cellulitis who needs IV antibiotics? Or, well, you know, no, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a clinical feeling. And that's really what we're trying to, is, um, you know, if that 89-year-old guy has a, you know, a lifetime of IV antibiotics and has, you know, had, you know, lung infection, had bronched and had something like nocardia in there, you know, that'd be intriguing to think that he, he may well have um, chronic granulomatous disease. So it's, it, it's the sort of general feeling. And, and so what we're trying to sort of do is help kind of set the thermostat for you guys to think about, you know, what might be normal, what are the outliers, and then, you know, what are some of those simple tests you might might do. So I think just thinking about it is the first step, right? We're because still learning a lot about primary immunodeficiency as well. So I was just looking back at something I wrote when I started, before I started my fellowship in 2012, um, and in there I had written that there were 150 described primary <laughs> immunodeficiencies. But I think if you look now, there's 250. So 
Um, we're kind of really at the tip of our iceberg about what we understand about primary immunodeficiency and how our immune system really works. Um, so again, it's really an expanding field and something that we're learning a lot about and will probably change a lot. Even over the course of two years, 100 new yeah. immunodeficiencies have been described. Yeah. That's crazy. And so that's, you know, so we're in immunology sort of our worst enemies, right? Because we talk about crazy CD4 and CD whatevers and all these signaling cascades and things. So here I've tried not to actually talk about any specific diseases. <laughs> and not talk about any CD molecules, or we did talk a little about a complement, but you know, we didn't get into intracellular signaling and all those things that immunologists love. Because mostly it's a clinical discipline. So sure, you n you're not gonna understand 300 of these diseases. I don't understand those 300 diseases, but I, I think I can see when, I've cro when someone's crossed the threshold from normal to abnormal, what are the red flags? That's the stuff that, you know, if you guys can know that and, and recognize those, you're doing a huge service to, to the patients. And then, you know, referring them on, calling people up. I'm happy to be called, and even with the time change, you can call me, call me up. I'd, I'd be delighted to talk about these patients and talk about testing and things. Yeah, so, so to finish up on this, you know, so they're not as rare as, as people might think. You know, one in 2,000, one in 10,000, that sort of number. Um, infections are the most common presentation, but with autoimmunity, uh, coming there. They can present at any age. And we want worry about infections that are recurrent and chronic and damaging the end organs and that are caused by wimpy bugs. Um, and making the diagnosis is you know, relatively easy and, and really transformative for the families and the patients. Um, hey, so let's talk about this thing. So if you're convinced that this is what you want to do forever. Allergen has been investing in, um, in the specialty and investing in sort of building clinician scientists in, in, in this field. And so um, offers uh, running competitions for these, these two year fellowships for people who are sort of at the end of allergy immunology, clinical training, would like to do time in the lab as a bridge to a faculty job. Um, and so far there's been a couple of um, a couple of people um, funded. One of them works with you a lot, both in, both in Quebec, so um, that's okay, but we wanna also get them out into other parts of Canada. So this is a, 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 a really important um, program that, that's worth knowing about. And yeah, so we have this uh, new person, Dr. Began, who's starting, who's, who's really interested in food allergy and is doing his time between Stanford and um, saint Justine. In, um, in Montreal. So, we've done a lot of talking. I don't know if you have more questions. Um, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, One was, you mentioned the cost of IVIG treatments for people who are immunodeficient. You know, it costs about $100,000 a yeah. year or so. Um, so, I was wondering about, like, I've had some hematology patients with CLL and things like that who don't produce really functional mm -hmm. antibodies. Mm -hmm. And the hematologists in general have just placed the patient on IVIG on spec for yeah. recurrent infection. Yeah. And that. How should we go about, or should we go about confirming that their antibodies don't work? Yeah. Well? Like, should we vaccinate them or revaccinate them? And yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's I, th I think it's more complicated. So, in the context of, um, you know, malignancy, I think it's, it's more complicated. I think IVIG replacement in certain selected patients. It, without sort of carefully documenting their humoral immune function is actually a pretty reasonable approach. Um, because sure, it, it's, it's somewhat expensive, but protecting these people from you know, infection and expensive stays in the ICU is, is really is cost effective. The people that I worry about, to be honest, and the ones I want us to be rigorous with starting are those who, um, I, you know, maybe are sort of middle-aged, are fatigued, have had a few sinus infections, um, and then maybe have a soft indication, low subclass, something like that. They start on IVIG and they never stop because, you know, frankly, we would all feel better on IVIG. It gives us antibody against all these things. We wouldn't get so many coughs and colds. Um, you know, it's, it's actually, will make us all feel better. So. 
I worry about those ones that you start them at 25, 30, 40, and then you're having 40 years of, of um, you know, plus of therapy without any reassessment of the and, or real confirmation of the diagnosis. So that's the important thing, I think, in, in sort of patients with malignancies or post bone marrow transplant, those sort of ones, it's entirely reasonable to do it without getting into this complicated documentation. And the other question that I had is, what is it about diabetes that makes them immunosuppressed? Is it just the fact that there's higher levels of circulating glucose for pathogens to use? Or is, is there any actual way that the elevated glucose, just like it glycosylates hemoglobin, does it impact the function of your immune system? Yeah, you know, so at the, the mechanistic level, that's not so well under, understood, I have, have, to, have to say. Um, but yeah, absolutely, it's associated with you know decreased immune function, you know, and then you combine that with you know if you're developing ulcers and other things or you know breakdown of those barriers, so you end up with with kind of multiple hits on the system. So no, I, I don't have a mechanistic answer for it. I had a patient uh, just last week actually who was admitted to our ICU from Labrador, who uh, was a diabetic and I'm hearing he's only other risk factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. who showed up with uh, unilateral facial swelling. Um, the doctor up there thought it was really unusual. Who knows, maybe it was actually hereditary injury. <laughs> but, but, but the physician up there treated him as if he were um, anaphylaxis. Sure. And he did develop some respiratory compromise and he intubated him. And then when he got here, um, the intensivist who was on uh, took one look at him and said it was so uh, we're still waiting on a postmortem to confirm oh, that, okay. but it was the only thing that that uh, kind of came up. And his only risk factor was diabetes. And the only other person I've ever heard of having hemochromicosis is a patient who had chemotherapy yeah. or malignancy. So yeah, I mean that, that pathogen goes with diabetes for sure. You know that was well recognized. I, I don't have a good answer. I don't know. Andy, you have a good answer for that one? No mechanism. Sorry. Just on the topic of mechanisms, is it known how IBIG works? Because the antibodies we produce have a degree of specificity yeah. to a bunch of things. And okay. what's it used into patients and what's that directed? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so I mean, it's helpful to think what it's in the bag, right? What's IBIG? So, so what it is, is you know, up to 10,000 blood donors, um, they're IgG, all pooled, essentially. So. It's used you know, in, in a variety of modalities. For immune deficiency, we're doing antibody replacement therapy, essentially. So monthly doses, 400 to 600 milligrams per kilogram is um, doses. And what we're giving those people is, is um, the antibodies kind of from this 10,000 strong cohort. So the antibodies they've made against vaccines they've received, against viruses and other things they've encountered. Um, so that's basically just giving them immune protection. So that's that replacement model. And that, when you think about it in that way, that um, you know, it's going to make you and I feel better too, probably, because we're not going to get sick from the being on the bus. Um, that's that's one modality it's, it's used, and that's kind of the easiest to understand mechanistically. We then use it as an anti-inflammatory medicine, right? At these big doses. Um, in pediatrics, we use it for Kawasaki disease at high doses. We use it for um, ITP, for some demyelinating CNS conditions and, and those sort of things. Uh, we're using that at higher doses and it has a bunch of immunomodulatory activity, damps down the immune response. For patients, say for ITP or, or some of these other things, it kind of swamps the ability to, um, for, so in ITP you have antibodies against your platelets and then they're pulled out in the spleen. By giving sort of this overload of antibody, it stops the splenic sequestration happening as, as much. So, and then when we think about it used in these inflammatory conditions, then I start waving my hands a lot about how it might work. No one really, really knows. So yeah, two modes. One, this sort of antibody replacement, and then mode two, immunomodulatory. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. Right. You mentioned earlier that uh, Crohn's disease is sometimes misdiagnosed when it's actually chronic granulomatous disease. 
how do we tell that apart? And is there any idea of like what percentage of people diagnosed with Crohn's actually have that condition? So I'm not sure about percentages. Um, in terms of ways to tell it apart, it would be unusual for someone with CGD to, to exclusively present with um, with granulomas in their in their bowel. So you'd want to take a good history about infections they've had other places. If they're having any chronic cough uh, on chest X-ray, is there any evidence of anything going on in their chest? Um, in particular for CGD, like skin uh, infections, um, you know boils would be uh, a common thing to, to see. So you, you'd want to think about those types of things, but it can, it can be tough to, to differentiate between the two. So um, there's lots of overlap between clinical immunology and other specialties, and that's a good area where they can work together. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, um, the other piece for us is, you know, really early onset Crohn's disease. So this is getting a pediatric role, but you know, kids with bad inflammatory bowel disease, who are less than one year of age, we worry about their immune system there. But that's not so relevant. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. I think um, this is where I started. Oh, yeah, this is my. So, hopefully, we've you know, convinced you that um, you know, allergy immunology is a worthwhile <laughs> pursuit um, and, and that you know, it's, it is a you know, very exciting, worthwhile field with lots of opportunity. So that was our goal. Um, but also to say that where there are, um, you know, good allergists, immunologists across the country who would be happy to help and be called, and I would put myself in that list, that if, you know, there's questions, I, we can often help by phone without physically seeing, seeing the patients. And, and you know, lots of people across the country would be happy to help with these, these questions. Um, I also want to introduce Michelle, who's been quiet down the back. Um, so Michelle, uh, Michelle works for um, with, with Allergen um, and is, is here and has put today on. So I wanted to I thank us, thank her for um, bringing us here and, and, and having this opportunity. But also to let you know that if there's you know questions that we can help with, sort of some of the matchmaking around um, you know opportunities in allergy, immunology, Michelle would be a, a great starting point for, um, for helping create those um, relationships and, and matchmaking there. So I would thank Michelle for being so wonderful and, and getting us here. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, ask you to, to contact her or me or Andy if there's any questions or any things we can help you with. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>